John Gruden wrote the Warriors Spurs game last night, which led a tweet from Zach Harper calling the pairing Daddy's Home Too. <laughs> Paying homage to the film with Mark Farrell and, and Will Farrell and Mark Wahlberg. All right, l listen, America, I need to tell you something about, about Al Davis's son, the owner of the Oakland Raiders. Can we zoom in on that haircut for a second? Just I don't know even know if you have to. People need to know this. He travels 500 miles to a barber in Palm Desert to get that haircut. It's impossible, Nick. I do not believe you. How does he travel in his 1997 Dodge Caravan SE with a bubble top Mark III conversion kit? If you call Mark Davis and he says he's at the office, do you know where he means he is? At the left end of the bar of the P.F. Chang's closest to his home. This is an odd man, is what I'm saying. That is all courtesy of Tim Keown's profile of Mark Davis. Yeah. ESPN the magazine. What's up, yeah. CC? Money don't, it, it don't, some people don't just do what they should with money. Oh. You know, because money's supposed to change you. Like, I would pray that he would change, but it didn't. <laughs> like, he needs a time machine. I mean, something to bring him up another 25 years. He travels 500 miles in car. No, to get all that, that means is that he surrounds himself with a bunch of yet guys. Yes, guys. How does my hair? Does my hair look good? Yes. You think I should keep going to this place to get my hair cut? Oh yes. What? What were the odds that of the Davis family, Al and Mark, I, I, Al <laughs> would be the better dressed, better that is coiffed funny. of the two? I just figured out why the Warriors started slow last night. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't take his eyes off him. Oh, my goodness. By right, the way, that's John Gruden. That's dressful yeah. success. And also John Gruden. Oh, this yeah. is the only way John Gruden's hair looks amazing. Next day. He ain't gonna build a Ford no haircut at that 100 million he gave Gruden. That's a good point. Time for some stories to start your morning. Baker Mayfield is starting to set up a couple visits with a couple different teams. He'll visit the Browns and Jets and Giants in the coming weeks. So, so tell me a little bit of what, what, what these visits now entail. I feel like we know everything there is to know about Baker Mayfield. And, and what does he need to do in order to, to be successful? In these interviews are very important. They're the last stages in their pro day workout, or the final stages. You have the tape for what, the, for what the, the kids achieved on the field. You have the combine results. You have all the interviews and investigative stuff, outward background checks. Yeah. But this is the final stage. You get the guy down in your facility. You're able to ask him hard questions about his personality. You're able to see, does he really fit into the culture? And also, you can do things that his agent haven't prepared him for. You can ask him things to be able to bring out his personality. Also, you can get him on the board and have more time to find out how much football does he know. So I believe this is one of the most important visits a young guy has. The teams can only bring in like 30 players, so it's very limited. When they decide to bring you in, I mean they have, very, they have a, a serious interest in drafting. And particularly important for Baker, because Baker's one of the, the yeah. not like Darnold or Rosen, where you know he's going to be gone by the top five picks, basically. Baker could be the first or second quarterback taken. He also could be a guy that's available come the 20th pick of the draft. So a lot of teams have real reason to talk to him as opposed to just checking it off, the checking a name on a box. And also because of the off-field concerns, if we want to call it that, whatever it is. I'm sure more so than with a guy like Sam Darnold or even Josh Allen. You want to get in a room with him and see how he answers your questions. All right, good performance from Tiger Woods yesterday. Finished one under par. He's only three strokes back of the leader. One thing to watch out for there, he did um, bang his club against a tree on the 16th hole. He appeared to have hurt his forearm. He set a little icing, and he was okay. Basically downlaid the injury. Let's turn to our golf expert, Chris Carter. CC, what did you think of Tiger's performance during the opening round of the Valspar Championship? It was very impressive. You can start to see that he's growing. Um, he's not spraying the ball as far, unless this drive right here on 16, that's not a true indication. You know, he was just missing the fairway by smaller amounts than other times that we've seen him. But the great things about Tiger Woods is he's always kind of sprayed the ball off the tee, and he's been able to recover. And in that recovery, he had a tremendous short game. So in this return, his iron play has been amazing. His ability to be able to putt the ball is still in the league. He's still one of the top five punters, putters that are on tour. People would say that he's one of the greatest putters, if not the greatest putter ever. So his ability to be able to make a number of birdies, and you can see yesterday in making five birdies, which is second most in the field, 
If Tiger continues to make those birdies, he'll get his drive squared away a little bit. His short game is outstanding, so I look for Tiger in the next two months. On a Monday, we will be talking about Tiger Woods and his return, come back full in the winner's circle. I wanted to talk about his mental toughness, which when he was at the top of his game was the greatest we'd ever seen in golf. And then as he started to struggle, you would see sometimes a couple bad holes would turn into six bad holes. He opened the second, the back nine, I should say, back-to-back -back birdies. So he was at three under. He was near the, or two under at the time, pardon me. He was near the top of the field. He then had back-to-back -back bogeys. He didn't let that derail him. Didn't have another bogey the rest of his round. Actually had a, uh, had a birdie on 17, I believe, the par 3, 17, to finish one under, get in the top 10. And, I mean, the leader is a guy named Corey Connors at four under. Then a bunch of guys at two and three under. He's right there. Right. Even though the best on tour, they're not on the leaderboard, this is one of the great tournaments. So it's a stellar field. Tiger needs to keep putting in rounds, make the cut, get in contention on Saturday and Sunday when the pressure and the blood is flowing before he gets in the We'll be talking about it on Monday. Yes. Warriors are a half game back of the Rockets in the West, but Draymond Green doesn't seem too concerned. Green said about the Warriors, quote, we're not going to spend the rest of our year trying to fight for the number one seed. Nick, you buying these comments from Draymond? Listen, they're not going to—they're so, not so concerned about the one seed. They're going to rush Steph back. I already said Steph's going to miss the next two games after he turned his ankle, and then we'll see. But I—I I think they should care about the one seed. They've never, in this iteration of the Warriors, not had the one seed, and the, this Rockets team is as good, if not better, than. Team, the team that pushed them the furthest they've been pushed in the West, the 2016 Oklahoma City Thunder. I think this Rockets team is better than that team. So I do think the one seed matters. Having game seven at home against those Thunder mattered. So I do think they should care about it, even if they're not consumed by it. I don't believe Draymond's telling the truth, but if he was telling the truth, okay, let's say, okay, what are they trying to accomplish the second half? They're not trying to get hurt. Oh, Steph just got hurt. Right. So that's not going to happen. So what they do, they're trying to get better continuity, be more engaged. That's what Steve Kerr said. So they've been winning. Don't they have one of the best records since the All-Star yeah. break? Nine, yeah. yeah, there's seven and one since the break. Okay, yeah. so they are trying to get better. So even though one the number one seed, it might not be important. Them playing better is. They're only a half game out with 20 games to go. Of course the number one seed's involved because they want to get better coming down the stretch. Seven and oh since the break, I should yes. say. All right, finally, the Celtics beat the T-Wolves 117-109 last night. Kyrie Irving had 23 points. Boston clinched a playoff spot, but there was a scary moment. Jalen Brown left the game after landing very hard following a dunk. Uh, injury aside, CC, uh, what's the ceiling, do you think, for this? And here it is again. I know it isn't. Here, uh, for this Celtics team. Uh, the, the Celtics, they have a good young team. But we have to make sure that we keep the proper perspective, uh, you know, around this team. Defensively, they started off t tremendous. But we just can't forget they lost their second best player in Gordon Hayward. Like, are they a championship caliber team without him? No, they're not. But it is nice to see Kyrie Irving in a situation where he's comfortable and with younger players who are developing. One with the scary incident we saw last night in Jalen Brown hanging on the rim, end up concussing himself, the momentum. Um, took him up under the hoop. He couldn't hold on to the rim, so he ended up falling on his shoulder, falling on his neck, a very, very scary thing. But his overall development... We should you, just mention, he is okay, or he's yes. he says he's a head injury, he, he, he walked, walked off on he his own. He walked off on, on his own. It looked like it could have been a spinal cord injury. It looked... It, it looked I, much I don't worse say, than... I don't want to say it wasn't bad, because the concussion's serious, but it was, it was one of those scary NBA falls. He's going full speed, he, he dunks it, mm -hmm. and his momentum carries him. He tries to hold on, and he's unable to hold on, but he did walk off the court but go ahead Steve. yes I, I believe their ceiling though would have to be the Eastern Conference Finals yeah. like you can't look to them to say okay are they an NBA champion no not yet I believe they're a year or two away from being legitimate contenders uh, for that title but if they were to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals after losing Gordon Hayward on the first day of the NBA season I would th consider that to be a great season also you would have Kyrie who has already transitioned into this new role of this is his franchise. He says he's comfortable, and they still got a bunch of picks. So they still, Danny Ains, he can still make some moves to put him in the championship category. But right now, ceiling, I would say, the Eastern Conference Finals, and they would be fortunate to be able to get there. Boston was in control throughout this game last night, but they hadn't blown it open. It was, I think, a nine-point game, eight-point game midway through the fourth quarter, and Kyrie up to that point only had 15 points. 
he then dominated to close out the game. He is the one that basically gave them the final closing margin in this game. They were able to overcome the, the shock effect of what happened to Jalen Brown, but what's their ceiling to me? There's, I, they can beat any team that is in the Eastern Conference playoffs, I believe, except Cleveland. Now, right now, for them, unfortunately, that would be their second-round matchup. So if that, if that ends up being the matchup, their ceiling would be the second round. If Cleveland falls to the four seed or if Boston gets up to the one seed, then their ceiling becomes the Eastern Conference Finals. But CeCe's right. Like, we got a little ahead of ourselves with Boston because of the 16-game winning streak, because they were 22-4. and four. They lost their best or second best player, depending on what you think of Gordon Hayward compared to Kyrie Irving. Jason, their second best player, stop. The, okay, well, I'm not, I, I'm not certain about that. I guess we'll see once they play together. But I mean, they lost, they lost one of their two All Stars. They have two All Stars on the team. They lost him five minutes into the year. And Jason Tatum is an awesome draft pick and going to be a great player. But rookies contributing in the playoffs for good teams, that doesn't really happen. Right. Even with Jalen Brown coming back, he's still only 21 years old. Jason Tatum just turned 20. So it could be a very successful season for them, even if they don't reach the NBA Finals, even if they don't reach the Eastern Conference Finals, as long as what they can't have happen is get bounced in the first round. They can't have that. That almost happened to them last year. They mm -hmm. ended up going seven. They can't have that happen this year. I don't think it will happen this year. All right, let's go back to football for a second. Second, and to the NFL Combine, this is a disturbing story. On Wednesday, former LSU running back Darius Geis revealed he was asked several inappropriate questions at the Combine. Geis told Sirius XM NFL Radio that one NFL team asked him if he liked men and if his mother sold herself. The NFL issued a statement saying these questions were completely inappropriate. So, Chris Carter, I'll start with you. What was your reaction when you heard about this? Um, I, I wish I could say that I was surprised, um, but to say that I'm not, um, I'm a little more embarrassed uh, because I, I've sat on TV 16 years, played 16 years in the NFL. This is the business that I talk about, the business I make my living. And to say that, that it's still a mentality, that, that it is not accepted, you know, to, to, to be a gay or be a lesbian, it's not accepted in the NFL. They say, oh, no, 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 we've made tremendous measures. Yeah, yeah, they have. But it's a culture that, that I know, and I just know from my own experience that it's, it's not accepted. Like, it is frowned upon. The reason why we haven't had an NFL player that's currently playing, you know, come out and say that I'm gay is because they know. They feel it. Now, we have college players that have done that. But in the National Football League, we've had guys come out after their career. But the reason why, because they know it's not accepted in NFL locker rooms. And the people that are picking the players, because that's what we're talking about, when you're doing an interview, they continue to allow these things to be part of their business. Why is it not accepted in NFL locker rooms? I don't know why. I can just say that overall, now to me, working in this business, um, I've learned so much, and I've come to understand so many different types of people. But in an NFL locker room, it's about being strong. It's about being macho. Um, I'm not trying to make excuses for them, but I'm just going to tell you the culture that that, that, that what what the locker room is is like. It's about the the the, the unfair, inaccurate stereotypes of gay men, because that's all they are: unfair, inaccurate stereotypes of gay men are anathema to what we think are the accurate and stereotypes being, of and pro people football being players. uncomfortable of those stereotypes and of people that have made that choice. And you and I have talked about this off the air. You feel like you have evolved um, enormously in your own mentality, in your own views, in the 15 and plus years. And that's because the reason the people that I'm involved with on a daily basis, right? one being my wife, making, me, making it present in our lives to be able to discuss it and to see that this necessarily wasn't a strong suit for me and to be able to work on it. And the people that I work with here on a daily basis, the people I work with in Los Angeles on a daily basis, they have helped me get to where I am right now. Where I'm very, very comfortable. And like, listen, and like with any idiotic prejudice, it tends to get broken down at least somewhat once you actually interact with people. Like the, the you know, people are, I don't know how this guy's going to act, I don't know. And then all of a sudden you work somewhere, you live around someone or your brother or sister is a gay person. You're like, oh, okay, they're the exact same. Like there, there, there is no difference. I, I, and so I, I want to say one thing about this particular incident. What would 
The NFL's reaction be if this was the question. Hey, Darius, how do you feel about Jews? Just, just throwing it out there. You know, I'm just curious. What, what would the reaction be? Because that's what the reaction should be to this. It is abhorrent. And the idea that there are still people in positions of power in the NFL that think America's fair labor laws do not apply to them in their special workforce of professional football. I'm going to ask you if your mother's a prostitute. I'm going to ask you if you're gay. Would that be acceptable in any job interview? Of course not. It's actually against the law right. in most states to even inquire on things like this. And the idea that the NFL, oh, we got to see. We got we to gotta knock them off balance. We got to see how they react. We'll find a better question. Well, the reason why I'm not surprised, um, a kid from Ohio State, Eli Apple, two years ago, uh, he was the first round pick with the Giants. Questions were asked about his sexuality. Other players in the past, things have been asked about their, their parents as far as their mother being involved in some type of prostitution. So, no. And what I witnessed this year, I watched Colin Kaepernick. I watched him not put him on the field. So you talking about discrimination? Like, yes. Yeah. Like, am I am I shocked that they're discriminating against people in the NFL? No, I'm not shocked by by what I've seen over the last 30 years and by what I saw this year. And go ahead, Jenna. No, I'm just. Uh, you, you brought this up, but what what are they what are they trying to gain by this? When you say they're trying to throw them off their game by throwing yeah. a question out there, I mean. What is the reaction that I, wouldn't work? Like, if they hit him, if they say, I'm so offended that I'm going to hit you? I, I, I don't know. I think for some of these guys, they ask the question because they, they, they hide behind, oh, we're just trying to throw him off. Like, when they ask Cam, are you a cat or a dog? And he said, I'm a human. I think, but I think for some of these guys, it's because they are worried the player might be, and they do not want a gay person in their locker room. I, I think the players, today's players, today's players, the vast majority are younger than I am. I'm like the older edge of millennials. I'm 33 years old. Most players in the locker rooms are younger than me. And that generation is way more accepting than any generation. And I don't like to use the word tolerance because tolerate means you, you, you deal with something that's bad. Acceptance and embracing is the words we should use. And more of these guys are better about that, at least generationally, than have been in the past. But I, what I would like to see the NFL do is the NFL power structure call up Darius and tell him, listen, we will do everything we can to make sure this does not negatively affect your draft stock, but we want to know what team this was. Because this team should be penalized the way you're penalized for tampering, the way you're penalized for circumventing the salary cap. This cannot be a part of how we decide who makes the NFL. It can't be, what do you think of gay people? What, again, like I said, how would we act if it were about a race? T tell me real quick, what do you think of Muslims, Darius? A little, fr little afraid? Like, where, where are you at? Like, it would be abhorrent. And like, I don't, I don't know the prejudice you've dealt with, Jenna. I know that it feels different, like, for, for men in pro sports than women, but I know that you, you came out on national television. I know that people, I'm sure, have treated you differently throughout in this industry because of your orientation. The whole thing's absurd. And, and, and that anyone would, would just say that's, well, that's part of doing business. It's, it, it, it bothers me to my core. Well, I'm not offended as a gay person. I'm offended as a human. It's just not what you want to ever be asked or have to even deal with. And it has nothing to do with the subject matter or who I am or what I could provide for you. Yeah, it has nothing to do with your ability to be able to do the job. And, and nor should it. And this is what I can guarantee. If the numbers, like if the numbers are, if we, if we have 53 males on each team, we got 32 teams. I can guarantee you, there's some gay guys playing in the NFL. No doubt. Okay? But none of them feel safe enough to, to come out and talk about it because the, the of reason, things the like The reason this. why we can't put a name with this story is because of that mere fact and because of that culture. And that's why it's nice here to say we don't support it. And the National Football League, they came out and issued a statement that these questions had been supposedly removed from the line of questionings that scouts and coaches could ask the players. In 1964... Over 55% of the country thought interracial marriage was immoral and something that you couldn't inflict upon the children. Chris and I are both now in interracial marriages. We look at that and we say, how idiotic were they? Anyone watching this show right now, I implore you 
to try to draw the logic ladder of why one is absurd and one's totally valid opinion to hold. Why it's one prejudice is okay and one is not. Because we're going to look back on these types of things with the same, are you bleeping kidding me, that we do on the old thoughts on segregation or any type of, it's about human rights. And, and no matter who you want to sleep with, man, if you run a 4 3 40, and you can catch the football. It shouldn't matter. You should, and you shouldn't have to feel like you got to hide it. Because there's a high school kid right now that is not living his best life because he can the pro football player. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to pursue it, but I'm going to have to hide this part of me. And that that ain't right, man. And yeah. the sad part is they already tried to do something about this. And if it wasn't for guys like Darius Geis who actually said something, we would just assume it wasn't still happening. So maybe just bringing a little light to it is just a yeah. tiny step forward. It, it's not something I'm proud of. I brag about all the time. My 30 years associated with the National Football League, it's not something I'm very, very proud of. They can do better. And we expect them to do better. All right, we're going to take a break. More First Things First next.